Good morning. Much has changed over the past 10 years since the attacks of 9-11 and the 2001 passage of the Authorization for Use of Military Force. <clears throat> Changes have been made to federal agencies, laws, and the lives of thousands of our men and women who have taken the fight to the enemy. We've borne the heavy burden of losing some of those brave men and women. These Americans, whether military or civilian, have paid the ultimate price as part of an effort to prevent terrorists from reaching our shores. Terrorists still pose a grave threat to the United States, but they have changed as well. We now face a diversified threat emanating from multiple locations. While we believe that Al-Qaeda's unrelenting work, that the, uh, while we believe that Al-Qaeda's capacity to launch widespread attacks has been diminished by the unrelenting work of our military and intelligence professionals. There are new and different faces of the same enemy in places like Yemen and Somalia. Our government's counterterrorism leaders say that Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula is now the greatest threat to the United States. We must acknowledge this reality and move forward. When I became chairman, I told our members that the committee must operate on a wartime footing. This is because, as members of Congress, we are charged by our constituents and Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution to provide for the common defense, define and punish offenses against the law of nations, declare war, raise and support armies, provide and maintain a navy, make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces, and to make rules concerning captures on land and water. It's time to reaffirm Congress's role in identifying the scope of the current conflict. And just as importantly, it's time to reaffirm Congress's support for those we have asked to defend us against the threats we face. These are the reasons why I believe the House strongly supported inclusion of the affirmation of the 2001 Authorization for Use of Military Force in the National Defense Authorization Act for the fiscal year 2012. Unfortunately, the administration has suggested that Congress is trying to limit options for handling terrorism suspects. Yet it is the administration's foreclosure of some of the most fundamental aspects of this war effort that have forced Congress's hand. For example, we recently heard Vice Admiral William McRaven confirm in his testimony before the Senate that bringing detainees to Guantanamo is and I quote, off the table. A law of war, war detention system for future captures focused on intelligence collection and keeping terrorists out of the United States is essential to our success. We cannot possibly prefer terrorists to be held aboard Navy ships, and we cannot possibly be comfortable with a policy whereby bringing terrorists to Guantanamo is off the table. But bringing them to the United States is not. In certain cases, prosecution may also be appropriate for law of war detainees. When it comes to deciding the forum for such prosecution, the administration has shown time and again that not only is prosecution in federal court their overwhelming preference for current detainees, it is the only option they will seriously consider for future captures. The administration has spent countless hours touting the federal criminal justice system. I agree that we have an excellent court system. I simply disagree that military commissions, like detention at Guantanamo, should be off the table for future captures. In fact, the strong preference should be for prosecution by military commission. The administration and their supporters also frequently cite the number of terrorism cases that have been successfully prosecuted in federal court. However, this is not a very helpful point of comparison, given that we do not know how many terrorists have instead been released and never prosecuted because of a lack of permissible evidence. Further, the uh, courtrooms at Getmo have sat empty for two and a half years at the direction of the administration. The commission system cannot prosecute cases that it does not have. The problem is further heightened when the administration delegitimizes the commission system with their words and actions. Attorney General Holder's reluctant announcement to prosecute the alleged 9-11 co-conspirators in a military commission during which he blamed Congress comes to mind. Why would an observer take seriously a forum that the administration itself 
seems to suggest is a lesser system of justice. I disagree with this notion. The military commission system is fair and just, and it should be resourced with the best personnel our government has to offer. Instead of undermining the system, Attorney General Holder and the Department of Justice should lend their full support and resources to the Department of Defense. And the military commission should be given a real chance to succeed. Perhaps then it will be fair to compare and contrast it with other systems. This is not a time to, for division. The war we are fighting is against our enemies, Al-Qaeda and their associates. It's time for us to affirm that our enemies and the legal authorities we have provided to fight them have evolved. So too must our policies, particularly those dealing with the law of war detention and prosecution. I now yield to our ranking member, Mr. Smith, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that we're having this hearing. I think these are critical issues, and they're critical issues that have not yet been resolved. And clearly, the conflict between the way Congress wants to resolve them and the way the President wants to resolve them has led to problems, has led to limitations, frankly, on how we can act, uh, beginning with the situation at Guantanamo Bay. Uh, part of the reason that the President is reluctant to bring uh, any future inmates to Guantanamo Bay is because of laws that Congress has enacted that severely restrict what can be done with inmates once they're taken there. Um, the larger debate about whether or not we should keep Guantanamo Bay open I think is still appropriate to have. I, for one, think we should close it. I understand there are those who are on the other side of that. But even if you feel Guantanamo Bay should remain open, this current situation is not advantageous to that position, a situation where if an inmate goes to Guantanamo, he cannot be transferred to the United States for trial. He cannot even be sent back to a home country because of the severe restrictions that have been, been placed on the President by the previous Congress and would be continued to place, be placed on the President by some of the bills that have been introduced and passed thus far. I think we need to clarify the situation one way or the other to have a clear policy. And I think the President and Congress actually agree on one basic principle, and that is all three options should be on the table. Um, you should have the option of indefinite detention, you should have the option of military commissions, and you should have the option of Article III courts. How do we keep all of those three options on the table in a realistic way? And I think by and large th there's agreement on that point. There's just a difference about when which option should be put in place, and that conflict, as I said, has now led to a very, very difficult situation where all the options are not realistically on the table. But yes, Article III courts have worked. And unfortunately, the bill that we passed out of here and out of the full House would have severely restricted the ability to prosecute people in Article III courts. Um, I will perfectly admit that some cases are not appropriate for that. But we're taking the opposite approach in this committee and this Congress and saying it's never appropriate and will not be allowed. That needlessly ties the President's hands. And as I think our witnesses will get into in greater detail and with more knowledge, um, there are certain advantages to being able to use Article III courts that if you take those off the table, uh, you create problems for our very ability to prosecute the war on terror. So yes, we need a clear picture on what our detention policy should be. We need a clear picture on what our interrogation policy should be. But I feel the cornerstone of that should be to keep all the options on the table and to not needlessly restrict the executive branch and their ability to prosecute that war. We're not there yet. Um, I appreciate the chairman's continuing to bring this issue up. Uh, we have worked very closely together on trying to uh, work out those details, and I'm optimistic that we will get there. Um, but it's appropriate that we have this hearing, appropriate that we have this discussion, so that hopefully we can get to a place uh, where the executive branch and the legislative branch's differences don't restrict our ability uh, to have all the options on the table and to fully prosecute this war. I will completely agree with the chairman's statements about how important this war is, about the fact that al-Qaeda and their affiliates still threaten us, and we need to be in a position to counter them. I just differ a little bit on what the policy should be and the best way to encounter them. Uh, last thing I want to do, uh, we have remarks by uh, John Brennan, um, which I would like to submit for the record without objection. Without objection to order. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. I uh, welcome our great panel of witnesses that are here uh, to speak on these very important issues today. We're honored to have with us today the former Attorney General and former Chief Judge of the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York, the Honorable Michael B. Mukasey. We also have former Principal Deputy General Counsel and Acting General Counsel for the Department of Defense, Mr. Daniel Del Orto. 
We also have former Deputy Assistant Attorney General for the Department of Justice's Office of Legal Counsel, Stephen Engel. And we have Professor Robert Chesney from the University of Texas Law School. Professor Chesney previously served as an advisor to the administration's Detention Policy Task Force and as a co-founder of the Lawfare blog. Very distinguished and uh, a panel who are very well versed in uh, our subject here today. We're happy to have you with us. Thank you for, the, for being here. We'll hear first from uh, uh, Judge Muca Mukasey. Chairman McCann, uh, Ranking Member Smith, members of the committee, uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to appear at this hearing and particularly uh, in the company of the people who are sitting here who are well informed and well able to testify on this subject, uh, which is one that's literally of vital interest to this country, uh, how we can go about defending ourselves against the threat of Islamist terror, which is the greatest existential threat to this country since the Civil War. The authorities available uh, to us to meet the terrorist threat are now controlled by what turns out to be a patchwork of statutes, policy improvisations, and court rulings. Uh, the principal statute, the authorization for the use of military force, is, as the chairman pointed out, 10 years old and was passed in the immediate aftermath of the attacks of September 11, 2001. Although two administrations have relied on it for authority to detain terrorists, the statute does not even mention the word detention let alone set standards for who to detain, under what circumstances, and where. We need a statute that helps organize and rationalize the process, like the one that you've passed, uh, affirming that we are in fact in a global war with shadowy adversaries who do not follow the rule of law. Our troops need clear, clear authority to capture and hold dangerous people and to obtain from them, when possible, valuable intelligence about others of their kind who may be out there. Three, I think three recent events dramatize the need for the statute that you, have, that you have passed. One is the testimony that was alluded to by the chairman of Vice Admiral William McCraven, McCraven, who made it clear in testimony to a Senate committee that there is in place no coherent policy with respect to terrorists encountered abroad, that we are faced with a choice between killing them, holding them on board ships for a limited time to obtain intelligence if possible, and then either sending them to another country that will take them bringing them to the United States for trial in a civilian court, or freeing them. We have also seen the recent disclosure that a man named Warsami was apprehended in April, held aboard one of our vessels for two months so that intelligence could be obtained from him, and then given Miranda warnings and brought to the United States to stand trial in a civilian court. And finally, a letter from 20 United States senators was all that prevented the administration from releasing to the Iraqis a dangerous Hezbollah commander who we have in our custody in Iraq, even though we have no guarantee that he would have been tried or held with appropriate restrictions by an Iraqi administration that is functioning increasingly as a satellite of Iran the closer we come to pulling our troops out of Iraq. The choice among un unpalatable alternatives, as described by Admiral McRaven, is what we face because our commanders do not have recourse to laws that empower them to capture and hold people whose principal goal in life is to destroy our civilization. A defendant charged with serious terrorist acts is brought to this country to stand trial in a civilian court, even though we have on the books a Military Commissions Act that suggests that he could be tried before a military commission. And even though we have a state-of-the-art facility at Guantanamo that can be used to detain and try accused terrorists without any of the risks of bringing them to this country and without the perverse reward to terrorist behavior that's inherent in treating accused terrorists better than soldiers who obey the laws of war. We have a defendant like Warsami brought to the United States to stand trial in a civilian court, even though his accused acts make him arguably eligible for trial before a military commission. That doesn't seem to have been considered. And even though we have available that state-of-the-art facility at Guantanamo, and even though we face hurdles in the civilian court that make the outcome far from certain as the result of his having been detained for two months aboard a naval vessel and interrogated before being advised of his legal rights, hurdles that would not be serious if he were being tried before a military commission. And finally, we have a hardened terrorist whom the administration proposes to release to Iraqi authorities at a time when we cannot rely on them to keep him confined and when, if we cannot continue to hold him in Iraq, we have available the facility at Guantanamo that we refuse to use. I'm grateful to this committee for considering uh, this uh, legislation and for passing it 
to replace um, and to, to bolster the system that we have with a reliable standard for assuring that dangerous people can be detained in secure and humane conditions. And I thank you also for your attention. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Mr. Del Orto. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Mem Member Smith, and members of the Committee for your invitation to appear before the Committee today. It is an honor to once again ap appear before this Committee, this time in my individual capacity. I commend the Chairman and the Committee for addressing the issues that are the subject of this hearing. I also am honored to appear with Honorable Judge McKaysey and with Steve Engel, with whom I had the privilege of working during my time in government and both of whom I hold in the highest regard. As some of you may recall, as a civilian attorney, I served as the Principal Deputy General Counsel of the Department of Defense from June 2000 through March 2009, not long after I completed a 27 and one-half year career as an active duty Army officer. I was in the Pentagon on 9-11 and thereafter participated in the formulation of the legal positions that the Department adopted in the aftermath of 9-11, including those relating to the interpretation of the authorization for the use of military force the legal basis for the conduct of operations against al-Qaeda, the basis for detention of captured enemy combatants, the decision to establish the detention facility at Guantanamo, and the implementation of President Bush's military order of November 13, 2001, which created military commissions. The authorization for the use of military force of September 18, 2001, has served the nation well. Nevertheless, at the 10-year mark, it is appropriate to consider whether there should be a reaffirmation of uh, that authorization and appropriate amendment. From the beginning of our fight against al-Qaeda well before 9-11, it has been apparent that we are at war against a non-traditional enemy. The non-traditional -tradi nature of our foe has required resourcefulness by every entity of our national security structure, from the rifleman on the ground in Afghanistan all the way up the chain of command to the President in his role as Commander-in-Chief. As the enemy has changed its tactics and the locations of the planning for and conduct of its attacks, the rifleman and his commanders at all levels have had to be nimble and adaptable in the face of the many challenges that this non-traditional foe has thrown at us. To the extent that the authorization for the use of military force falls short of providing the President and his subordinate commanders with the full range of authority he and they need to bring the fight to this changeable foe, then it should be adjusted to do so. As one who has advised and aided senior civilian and uniform leaders at the Department of Defense as they wrestled with the decisions related to the detention of enemy combatants, the establishment of the detention facility at Guantanamo, and the structure of military commissions, I remain firmly supportive of those initial decisions and remain convinced that those decisions were correct at the time they were made. There is absolutely every reason to continue to move important detainees to Guantanamo for detention and intelligence gathering and I remain firmly convinced that the military commissions should be the preferred forum for the adjudication of the war crimes committed by those who have been waging war unlawfully against our nation and its citizens. I am prepared to respond to your questions. Thank you. Mr. Engel. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman McEwen, <clears throat> Ranking Member Smith, and members of the committee. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to appear here today to discuss the legal framework for the war on terror now nearly 10 years after the attacks of September 11th. Uh, and I'm particularly honored to appear beside Judge McKaysey and Mr. Del Orto, two extraordinary public servants with whom I had the privilege of working during my time at the Department of Justice. On September 11th, Al-Qaeda took the United States by surprise, and the legal framework for this conflict has taken the better part of the decade to catch up. The traditional laws of war are premised upon principles of reciprocity and the distinction between combatants and civilians. That framework provides clear answers to who may be detained, how they must be treated, and where they should be prosecuted. None of these answers is self-evident when it comes to the non-traditional enemies against whom we fight in the war on terror. The committee, in enacting the National Defense Authorization Act for, this, uh, for 2012, has taken an important step forward in addressing these questions. Section 1034 in particular would update the statutory authorization for this conflict by codifying the definition of who we are fighting that the executive branch over two administrations now has relied upon in this conflict. The act would affirm that the United States is engaged in a continuing armed conflict with Al Qaeda, the Taliban and associated forces and that in this conflict the president may detain those who are a part of 
or who are substantially supporting the enemy. None of this should be controversial. The Obama administration currently relies on these very same words in fighting this war, and these words have been vindicated by the D.C. Circuit. Yet some have claimed that congressional authorization could constitute a new declaration of war that would dramatically expand the conflict. Uh, I confess that I do not understand this. Congress already has authorized the president to wage war against al-Qaeda and its supporters wherever they may be found. One week after the September 11th attacks, Congress granted the president the current statutory authority uh, under the Authorization for a Military Force, the AUMF. By its terms, this statute was not limited to al-Qaeda and it was not limited to Afghanistan. Rather, Congress authorized the president to take the fight to the enemy no matter where they, are, where they were or where they spring up over time. Over the past decade, U.S. forces have done just that, fighting al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and Pakistan and its affiliates in places such as Iraq, Yemen, and Somalia. In the course of that conflict, the United States has captured al-Qaeda members in those countries and many others and has detained them under the laws of war. Section 1034's definition of the enemy thus does nothing more but also no less than give the president's interpretation the force of law. The statute is needed because the AUMF was appropriately focused on the September 11th attacks, yet over the past decade, the threat from al-Qaeda and like-minded organizations has developed in new and different ways. It is no doubt reasonable for the president to classify al-Shahab, the Pakistani Taliban, or al-Qaeda's homegrown franchises in Iraq or Yemen as part of the same enemy with whom we are at war at uh, under the AUMF. But as the United States continues its military operations outside of al-Qaeda's original hideouts in Afghanistan, and as litigation challenges emerge to such decisions, as they inevitably will, it becomes increasingly important for Congress to weigh in. In the absence of a clear statement from Congress, the courts may well have the last word in determining whom we, we may detain and, by extension, whom the military may target. I appreciate the committee bringing attention to these issues, uh, and I appreciate uh, the committee putting this issue on the forefront of the National Defense Authorization Act. That statute will strengthen the administration's hands in the courts and thus strengthen our ab military's ability to take those measures necessary to protect our national security. Thank you, Chairman McKeon and Ranking Member Smith, for the invitation to appear here, and I look forward to our discussion this morning. Thank you very much. Professor Chesney. Chairman McKeon, Ranking Member Smith, and members of the committee and staff, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My aim is to convince you that the optimal policy is one in which the President has and is willing to use the maximum range of lawfully available tools when it comes to capturing, getting intelligence from, and ensuring the long-term incapacitation of terrorists. Towards that end, I want to make three points. Point one, civilian criminal prosecution in some instances is the most effective tool for ensuring the long-term detention of a terrorism suspect. Congress should not take this tool out of the President's hands. This can be true for several reasons, one of which is illustrated by the Warsami case. Simply put, the civilian trial option will not require the government to prove the details of the relationship among al-Qaeda, al-Shabaab, and al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. This is something the government no doubt can do in a closed-door setting, in a classified briefing, but may well prefer not to do outside of a skiff in the interest of protecting sources and methods and in order not to reveal the current state of our penetration of these networks. A military commission trial, in contrast, might require such a showing in order to establish personal jurisdiction over Warsami. And such a showing would also likely be required eventually were we simply to hold Warsami in long-term law of war detention at Guantanamo or elsewhere, as it's more likely than not that a person captured in his circumstances would eventually establish the right to habeas review. Of course, there are other factors relevant to the decision as to which system makes the most sense for long-term detention in a particular case, and I discuss these other factors in considerable detail in my written testimony. For now, it suffices to say that one size doesn't fit all, and it doesn't make sense to make an across-the-board predetermination to the contrary. Now, that's true for all the lawfully available options, which brings me to my second point. Other options that are lawful in certain circumstances include both trial by military commission and, separately, the use of military detention consistent with the law of war. In some instances, in fact, one or the other of those options will be the most effective tool available to incapacitate a dangerous person for the long term. When that is the case, and even if Guantanamo is the only practically available location for using them, the administration should be willing to use these options and not just for legacy cases. That is to say, the President shouldn't take these tools out of his own hands going forward. 
Now, you'll notice so far I've only been talking about the options for long-term detention. I have not been talking yet about collecting intelligence, and that brings us to my final point. The question of how best to detain over the long term and the question of how best to acquire intelligence from a captured person are two different matters, and the answer to one does not dictate the answer to the other. For example, selecting civilian criminal prosecution as the best tool for long-term detention in a particular case by no means obliges the government to Mirandize the person upon capture, to cease questioning if the person asks for a lawyer, to employ only law enforcement personnel as questioners, or otherwise to treat a terrorism suspect as if it's a run-of-the-mill criminal or questioning is merely designed to obtain evidence admissible in court. Far from it. As Warsami illustrates, in terrorism cases, one can and frequently should prioritize intelligence collection on the front end, even though this wouldn't be ideal from the standpoint of a possible prosecution on the back end. But it doesn't follow that you just can't prosecute on the back end or that you somehow shouldn't prosecute on the back end. What does follow, I think, is that all these decisions require nuanced, professional, case-specific judgments with participation from the military, the intelligence community, and the Justice Department. And, of course, they also require access to the full slate of legally available tools and the will to use them. In conclusion, let me emphasize that my written statement goes into far more detail on all of this, and it also addresses a range of other issues raised by the Warsami case including matters such as uh, detention on naval vessels and uh, the law relevant to ICRC notification and access. I look forward to your questions, and I thank you very much for your sustained and serious attention to this important issue. Thank you very much. Our um, committee vice chair needs to leave to go to another hearing, so I'm going to uh, turn my time over to him at this, at this time. Mr. Thornberry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and appreciate each of, of y'all being here uh, today. There, there's a number of issues and ramifications at stake in, 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 in what we're talking about, but I want to focus on the first and, and most basic issue, and that is whether Congress should affirm and update the authorization for the use of military force that was passed in September 2001. And as Mr. Engel referenced in his testimony, there's been some criticism of the section in the House Pass Bill, Section 1034. Some people say, well, the courts, uh, you are just adopting the court uh, interpretation of the AUMF, so you really don't need to do it. It doesn't change anything. Just let the courts continue to adapt and, and interpret the uh, September 2001 authorization. A second criticism, which is kind of coming from the opposite way, is that, oh, this is a vast new expansion of power uh, with no limits of time or geography. Uh, so I would appreciate each of you uh, giving us your opinion on whether Congress should affirm and update the authorization for the use of military force and whether you think either of those criticisms uh, have merit. Do you think that it's uh, okay for courts to uh, interpret when the United States can use military force? And are you concerned about some vast uh, expansion? And uh, Professor Chesney, if I may, since somebody's from the University of Texas Law School, hook them, uh, I'd, I'd ask you to go first. Um, first, one of the issues that lurks in the background that we've not probably paid enough attention to is the fact that the existence of ongoing relatively conventional conflict in Afghanistan has made it relatively easy for everyone to agree that there's at least some combat going on somewhere that entitles us to detain somebody. It's entirely foreseeable that in the next year or two, for better or worse, that may not still be the case. And when that situation develops, when that is our situation in Afghanistan is similar to our current situation in Iraq. We're drawing down, we're leaving, we're no longer engaging in sustained combat operations. There will be an argument that will emerge that there's no longer authority under the original AUMF to detain anywhere. I think it would uh, be a very smart move on the part of Congress to clarify that for purposes of our domestic law, we do not condition our detention authority with respect to Al Qaeda on the existence of combat operations in Afghanistan. And this is something that Congress could head off by um, making clear there's detention authority and it's not linked in that way. Um, a second uh, issue is the question of whether it's even possible by statute to tamp down the debate over what's the scope of the authorization. Everybody agrees Al-Qaeda counts, the Taliban counts. 
But when, when push comes to shove and you peop, when people start getting down in the weeds, they often don't really agree about what they think the boundaries of al-Qaeda actually are and whether it encompasses various affiliated groups. The question of the moment, as the chairman indicated in the opening remarks, AQAP, al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, may be the greatest threat we face. There's debate about the extent to which it's encompassed by uh, the existing AUMF. Uh, the administration takes the position, I believe, that AQAP is effectively part of al-Qaeda. And th that may be the right interpretation. There's going to be debate about that. It's not clear if and when there's an AQAP detention that the courts necessarily will agree with that. It might be wise to eliminate that sort of uncertainty. But then you have even more difficult groups like al-Shabaab where the ties, whatever they are, are relatively looser by, by a considerable amount than they are as between al-Qaeda and AQAP. In that circumstance, a difficult question that I'm not sure can be eliminated by statute will remain as to which groups are sufficiently associated with the AUMF named groups to count. The, the current uh, House passed version of the NDAA uh, confirms the administration's position that asso uh, associated forces, co-belligerents, are encompassed, but it doesn't actually define that term. And, and I'm not exactly sure how best to define that term. That, that may be some indeterminacy that's just built into this framework. Mr. Engel. Sure. Thank, uh, <clears throat> thank you. Um, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, I think it's very important that Congress take the, this on. Uh, essentially, uh, the AUMF isn't only about who we detain. It, it has been elaborated and interpreted by the courts in the context of the Guantanamo habeas litigation, but it also affects who we target. So it basically is the definition of who we are fighting in this war. Uh, and I think it's very important and appropriate in our constitutional structure that the political branches, and particularly Congress, take a lead role in making these determinations. When we talk about what are the courts saying, what are the courts doing, the courts are trying to figure out what Congress meant when it passed the AUMF uh, almost 10 years ago now. Uh, and you know, I think it's, it's very important and appropriate for Congress to weigh in and to clarify, basically by making clear it agrees with uh, the views of the executive branch, because uh, this goes really to the heart of who we're fighting and our, our national security. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Del Orto? I would echo what uh, Mr. Engel and uh, Professor Chesney have said. I think one of the keys here is that we need to be looking forward rather than rearward. And to the extent that we have demonstrations of how Al Qaeda and its branches and sequels are unfolding, we need to be prepared to address that. And I think that anything that would limit the scope of our activities to certainly Afghanistan would put us in a position where we will not be ready for the emergence of the next branch or sequel. Uh, and in point of fact, it would acknowledge what we're doing today. We have these operations taking place in many parts of the world, and I think we need to maintain the authority to do so. I also agree that the courts should not be the place where this is determined. I think the courts rightfully, they've been drawn into this somewhat reluctantly, I think, uh, are, are doing their best to interpret what Congress has, has established by way of the law. And the more clarity we can establish through legislation, I think the better off uh, everyone will be. Judge? Um, I agree with the comments of, of the prior speakers. I would add only uh, two things. First of all, um, this question of what it is uh, that allows us to continue to detain has not been passed on by the courts as yet, and I think that uh, Professor Chesney makes an important point in saying that we ought to head that off right now. It's because having that argument advanced uh, could result in freeing an enormous number of people who should never see the light of day. Um, secondly, the, the, the notion of defining a list of uh, organizations that are against us and then checking whether somebody is or isn't on the list and making targeting decisions on that basis and capture decisions on that basis simply doesn't work. Um, Al-Qaeda and those associated with them don't care who's on the list, and this is not a, it's not a motorcycle gang with, you know, who wear, who wear jackets that are emblazoned with a particular label, and as soon as we kill off everybody who's wearing the jacket, we win. Um, they didn't care on 9-11 whether we had anybody on a list or not, and they're not going to care now. Um, you need to look no forward than the, the, no further, I should say, than the Times Square bomber, Faisal Shahzad, uh, when he was captured. Uh, it turned out he was associated with the Pakistani Taliban. That wasn't on the list, and there was actually a debate about whether we had authority to hold him. Um, that, shouldn't, that shouldn't happen. Uh, Anwar al-Awlaki 
was self-radicalized in the United States is now in a leadership position um, in AQAP. Again, um, somebody who may not neatly fit a category, but somebody who is undeniably um, at a war with this country. And we should be equally free to oppose the people who are at war with us. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Davis. Uh, Ms. Bordallo. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Chesney, my first question is for you. You observed that a military commission trial, one, may not have proper jurisdiction or available charges to try someone like Warsama, and two, may pose additional risk for revealing sensitive intelligence information because of all the additional evidence needed for military commissions. Prosecu uh, commission's prosecutors to establish jurisdiction over suspects like Warsama. Can you elaborate on these points? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the point I was trying to get at is one that is not necessarily going to arise in many, if not, or even most cases that would be part of the civilian trial versus military commissions debate, but it does seem to be one that's, that's raised here, and there's been intimations in media accounts that this was part of the internal analysis. Um, in a military commission proceeding, there's a statutory personal jurisdiction requirement um, that is a bit complicated, and I won't get down into the details of it. Suffice to say that there does need to be certain showings made to ensure that this is a person within the scope of the armed conflict that's at issue here, someone engaged in hostilities or an al-Qaeda member, and so on and so forth. Um, the factual predicates that are built into that showing are not identically repeated in a civilian setting where you're simply charging the person with having provided material support to one of these groups or having, uh, I believe the charges in this case include bearing arms while doing so and then uh, instructing others in uh, how to make explosives and receiving military style training. Uh, in short, it's possible that in order to establish jurisdiction in a commission proceeding, the government would need to reveal more than it would in a civilian court regarding the existence of a relationship between some or all al-Shabaab members, possibly just some, al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which seems to be the, the liaison relationship that Warsami was involved in, and the relationship of both of those two with al-Qaeda proper. That doesn't necessarily need to be done, in fact, probably does not need to be done in a civilian trial. Now, that, as I mentioned in my testimony, is not the only consideration that matters here, but it's a substantial one, and one can readily imagine that the intelligence community might have preferred, all things being equal, not to be put in a position where it has to decide whether to come forward with the evidence that fleshes out the relationship amongst these groups. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mukasi, my next question is for you. You are critical of holding terrorism trials in Article 3 because you claim that such trials would reveal sensitive national security information. However, what we know is that the government has carefully crafted tools under the Classified Information Procedure Act, or SIPA, that allows sensitive national security information to be protected. As a result, one study after another of international terrorism cases have shown that in the hundreds of terrorism trials that have taken place in Article III courts, sensitive national security information has never been revealed when the government uses the tools made available it, to it under uh, SIPA, SIPA. In fact, SIPA works so well that the military commissions have modeled their classified information protection rules on SIPA. Given these facts, why do you continue to believe that classified information would be better protected in military commissions, which have little experience handling sensitive information, than in Article III courts, which have almost three decades of experience handling sensitive national security information? I believe it based on my own experience um, and based on the trials of which I am aware. Um, the case, the terrorism case that I tried, um, United States versus Abdul Rahman et al. Um, started out with the government having to provide, as it does in all conspiracy cases, a list of unindicted co-conspirators. That necessarily included all the people that the government was aware were associated with the defendants in that case. It included a then obscure man named Osama bin Laden. We found out later on that within 10 days of the service of that list, it was in the hands of Osama bin Laden in Khartoum, where he was then residing and he was then able to determine 
not only um, that we knew about him, but who else within his organization we knew about, and to take appropriate action. And from every account, he did. There are other instances of testimony coming out in criminal prosecutions um, that is later used as virtually a smorgasbord by, uh, by terrorists. In addition, the need to keep agents from testifying to classified information um, is something that the government feels, but obviously defense lawyers do not feel it and shouldn't feel it. That's not their job. And so they will push to the limit with the result that government agents will appear to be and have appeared to be evasive or uh, restrictive in their, in, their, in their testimony and in their responses in a way that colors uh, criminal prosecutions that would not happen um, in, a, in a military commission. And as far as um, having to reveal um, means and methods in a military commission, I have to say that I am frankly mystified by Professor Chesney's testimony on that point. Um, if you think that a military commission presents uh, difficulties in the Warsami case as compared to what is going to happen in a civilian court, I can give you two words of advice. Stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Bartlett. Thank you. Nearly 19 years ago, before I came to the uh, Congress, I must confess that when I uh, heard the term military tribunal or military commission, it conjured up images of a uh, banana republic, a trial at midnight, and execution at dawn. If I had been asked to give an example of a kangaroo court, I probably would have said a military tribunal. Now, 19 years later, nearly 19 years later, having been on this committee, I have a very different view of our military commissions. But where we house our prisoners and where we try them is in a large sense a political decision. Not every citizen of the world has had the opportunity I've had to sit for nearly 19 years on this committee. So how does the average citizen of the world perceive military tribunals? In politics, of course, perception is reality. So what is the perception of the average citizen of the world about military tribunals? May I? Um, the, one of the most interesting things about the military commission's perception issue, which I completely agree is, is a terribly significant one, is that we're not doing the best we could to let the rest of the world know how legitimate and just the system, as you've just described it, is. Part of the problem is that it's very difficult for outside observers to know what's actually happening in the proceedings as they go on. The uh, small number of reporters and interest groups that send personnel down there to monitor what's happening provide some outside access to what's happening, but not nearly as much access as could be uh, as could be to our interest. It would be very advisable for the Department of Defense to make it far more transparent what is happening there, including a great expansion of the amount of closed circuit coverage and, and availability, including here in the in the Washington area for for more than just a small number of reporters and journalists to monitor these proceedings. The, there will be a good story to tell, I believe, but we're not putting most people in a position to actually hear it. It's all getting filtered through a small number of observers who are, in, who are in many cases very critical of the system. Emphasizing the importance of perception, General Petraeus, in a uh, not private but uh, not really public conversation, indicated the enormous problems that Guantanamo Bay created for him in his area of responsibility in the military. Let me read something from um, what we passed in the Congress nearly 10 years ago now. The president also has the authority to detain persons who were part of. I have no idea how the president would know they were a part of something without a trial and a jury and a verdict. Or substantially supported Taliban or Al-Qaeda forces or associated forces that are engaged in hostilities against the United States or its coalition partners. If I just take those first few words, absent the uh, uh, 
emergency that we were in at that time. Wouldn't you have thought that this was pretty patently unconstitutional to say that the president could, without any court action, without any trial, determine that a person uh, were part of a substantially supported Taliban or al-Qaeda forces and therefore detain them indefinitely without any counsel, without any opportunity to, to uh, uh, defend themselves? Congressman Bart, let me at least take a, a stab at that. Again, if you premise the, the authority on the laws of armed conflict and the law of war, then clearly uh, the president has the authority, as do the subordinate commanders, to make those determinations on the battlefield. And that's exactly what was done from day one. Uh, the detention authority uh, stems from the, the, op the authorities pursuant to uh, the recognized international uh, law of armed conflict. And but, sir, isn't the battlefield here essentially anywhere and everywhere? Well, I, I think in certain, in certain respects it is, Congressman, because the enemy has shown an ability to project its force from virtually anywhere to here. Uh, as contrasted to previous uh, conflicts where there was a, essentially somewhat of a geographic limitation on the enemy's positioning and the locations from which he projected his force, certainly we got used to the notion of a, a geographical limit on some of that uh, on the conflict. Here, um, we have an enemy who moves about and um, may launch his attack from Afghanistan, may launch it from Pakistan, may launch it from uh, Somalia, Yemen, uh, and we've seen that. We've seen that with the coal bombing and, and other instances where this enemy pops up and, uh, and fights at a place of his choosing. Uh, and so I, I think that the authority to detain very, very reasonably can be applied to a, a variety of areas that are not necessarily well defined by a, a nation's geographic boundaries. Thank you. If I could just add one point to um, the answers that have been given so far. Um, the First of all, the choice of the battlefield was not ours. Uh, that choice was made by the people who launched attacks against us. And we can, if we wish, limit the battlefield for our own purposes, but it's not going to limit it for theirs. Secondly, as uh, Mr. Delorto pointed out, this all takes place in the context of the laws of war. The laws of war recognize that um, people who wear uniforms, follow a recognized chain of command, carry their arms openly, and don't target civilians are entitled to a certain level of treatment when they're captured. And they receive that level of treatment. But these people don't do any of those things. And the, the old rule was that if such a person was captured, uh, they could be treated, as the books said, summarily, which generally meant stand up against this wall, we'll be with you in a moment. Now, we've, we've, we've come substantially beyond that. Um, but we are by no means obligated to bend ourselves into pretzels um, to treat people in that situation the same way that we treat ordinary criminal defendants. Not at all. Did I hear you had a, an occasion of a, some special uh, thing happened to you last week? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Did that change your name or anything? Do we no, I'm keeping the same name. <laughs> Same name I've had since I was born, so thank you, but thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Congratulations. Um, I wanted to give uh, Professor Chesney a chance to uh, direct some comments to the whole issue of the Article 3 versus Military Commission's question that was put forward. Would you like to do that? I would like to address uh, one point, because I think uh, it may be that uh, Attorney General Mukasey may have misunderstood my point earlier about the particular issue raised in the Warsami case. I wasn't suggesting that civilian criminal trials have better capacities to protect sources and methods than military commissions do. Uh, it's at least equal, and perhaps the military commissions are, are slightly better at this because they've had a chance to codify things about SEPA that um, are generally done in practice now by the civilian courts but aren't in SEPA itself. But rather my point was that the actual substance of what needed to be proved would be different in that particular case. That is, 
Warsami, under the indictment that's been brought in the Southern District of New York, um, what the government needs to prove in that instance doesn't require it in any way to try to prove anything about the relationships amongst these various Al Qaeda and Al Qaeda franchise entities. Um, whereas the military commission process, regardless of what charges were brought, by virtue of the personal jurisdiction provisions, will require such proof. That, that is one way in which you could have a serious uh, difference between the two systems. I don't think that's a frequently recurring situation, but I think it arose in this instance and would arise in any al-Shabaab, AQAP, or other non-core al-Qaeda, non-core Taliban type case. Uh, other issues that are worth keeping an eye on that this committee should be aware of include the difference in the substantive charges available in the following respect. There is ongoing litigation as to the legitimacy of charging material support and conspiracy in military commission proceedings. Uh, in particular, it is a quite open question, if not a doubtful question, as to whether the D.C. Circuit or the Supreme Court, at the end of the day, ultimately will allow the commissions to charge material support and conspiracy for pre-2006 conduct. The current state of play is that an intermediate military court, the Court of Military Commission's review, has upheld the constitutionality or the legality of charging material support, but this is just the beginning of years of litigation that are still in our future. The D.C. Circuit will have the next crack at it, and beyond that, if the Supreme Court grants cert, it will decide the question. There is some reason to believe, and I think a lot of people have looked at this closely, think it's at best a 50-50 call how the Supreme Court ultimately will come down on this. If they come down negatively on this, as to a lot of the earlier cases, not going forward cases, but the existing legacy cases, this will take away a pretty important tool in the tool set for prosecuting in a commission setting. This doesn't affect all the cases. It affects some of them. Um, okay. Well, first of all, I think that even though we have had some people since directly after 2011, after we uh, declared the, or the President declared the global war on terror, and we have people still detained, I mean, I, I, I have a hard time believing that most of those people that we have left are actually even going to come forward into some sort of a, um, of, of a process, if you will. But, I, you know, I have been one of the few Democrats, I think, that ha on this committee that has um, uh, advocated for keeping uh, Guantanamo Bay open and for uh, military commissions. So I'm one of the few people, I think I was the first one to drop a bill maybe about two or three years before uh, the Hamden case ever came down and required this committee to, at that point, act. Um, it, but I wouldn't preclude the fact that I think that we should keep both systems open and available to doing this. My question, and the reason I think commissions is a great place to try a lot of it is because of several issues, including, you know, fog of war, um, evidentiary chain uh, uh, requirements, uh, Miranda rights, if you will, a whole host of things that are introduced once one takes a look at um, the federal system and I think don't work well within um, some of the issues that go on with respect to the types of people and where we pick them up and how we pick them up. A and I guess the two questions that I really have that I'm hoping you all can sort of enlighten me on is what difference has that made with um, the court's ruling that Gitmo is now a special place and inures with it some special rights to the people that we've had held there um, as opposed to before? And the second issue is what, what do you think, uh, understanding that I think most of these things would be best held in the military uh, 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 system, where do you think are some of those situations that would be better placed within um, our federal system? Anybody want to take a crack at those two questions? Um, well, <coughs> well um um, with respect to your first question, in terms of the impact of Boumediene and the Supreme Court's holding that uh, the constitutional right of habeas corpus applies to Guantanamo Bay, that's some issue that now, almost three, now three years after Boumediene, the courts are really still working it out. The Supreme Court held that it had jurisdiction, uh, you know, or that the federal courts would have jurisdiction, but it did not elucidate and consciously reserved the question of what other rights uh, would apply you know, to Guantanamo Bay. Uh, and that's something that the federal district courts uh, have 
uh, in developing habeas procedures have been sort of all over the map, uh, and they have gradually been corralled by a number of D.C. Circuit decisions, which has provided some content at least to the substantive standards for habeas. Now, none of that answers fully what, what would apply in a military commission process and the like. Those are questions that the military commission courts have been working out, uh, and they have taken something of a case-by-case -case basis where they look at uh, whether the, the procedural rights at issue are fundamental, and they have generally held that the processes that this Congress has provided in the Military Commissions Act in 2006 and 2009 are sufficient, uh, you know, with some glosses uh, here and there. But uh, these are issues that are still working their, their ways out in the court. What is clear, of course, is that if individuals were in the United States, they would have a full panoply of rights. And while that may permit commissions to go forward in the United States, uh, it would raise you know, much more, you know, severe. Uh, obviously, questions. and that's one of the reasons why I think it's best to keep them in the mil military commissions if we can. Um, do you think it would be um, that there would be a place for this Congress to delineate, not wait for um, the courts to sort of apply um, what, what those rights might be? I, well, I, I, I think that this Congress really has done so uh, with the Military Commissions Act in 2006, 2009. Uh, Mr. Bartlett mentioned earlier about his image of military commissions and military courts. I think this Congress has provided the most developed procedures, the greatest amount of due process, I think, that we've ever seen in any kind of military commission system. And so I, you know, I, I would submit that Congress has weighed in and has provided appropriate protections under any constitutional standard. But certainly if there's tinkering to be done, those are, those are questions for this, this body to consider. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I realize that my time is done, and I hope that I can submit that other question to the record for the gentleman before us to try to answer. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Mr. Whitman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank the uh, panelists for joining us today. Uh, Judge Mukasey, it seems like the administration's policy for evaluating uh, detainees for transfer seems to have a little inconsistency there. And I want to ask a comparison to look at the policy that's used for the transfer release of someone like um, Mr. Wasami in the case where he was detained on a ship versus other evaluations such as for, for Gitmo. And if you could give me your opinion on where you believe the differences are there and is there a reason for the difference from a, from a legal standpoint? And in electing to release a detainee from the ship, should the potential for re-engagement be considered or the possibility of re-engagement be mitigated in consideration of, of both of those, I would say, divergences in policy with relation to detainees? Well, let me answer your second question, your last question first. Um, the, policy, the possibility of re-engagement always has to be considered. The whole purpose of capture in, in, a, in a conventional war, and, and it would be only underlined in, a, in an engagement like we're in uh, with these folks is uh, to immobilize somebody who is dangerous and prevent them from returning to the fight. I mean, a catch and release program is, is, uh, is the last thing in the world that you want. Um, so far as Warsami is concerned, I, the sense I have is that that was something of it. I, obviously, I don't have a, a window into the decision-making process in the, in the current administration. But the sense I have is that that was somewhat of, a, of, uh, of, a, um, of an innovation uh, and of an improvisation. Um, in some measure in response to the legislation uh, that barred the transfer of uh, detainees from Guantanamo to the United States. They didn't put them in Guantanamo. They held them on a ship, uh, debriefed them for some period of time, then brought in a clean team to give them, to give them Miranda warnings and then bring them to the United States. Um, I should add that, as it happens, paradoxically, holding somebody on a ship is itself arguably um, a violation of uh, one section of the Geneva Accords. Now, whether that is a section that applies to people like this at all. I would argue that it doesn't. But it just shows you how problematic that whole process is. And we can't continue to make these decisions ad hoc. Um, we need to have a, a systematic way of assuring principally our safety. Um, secondly, our intelligence gathering capacity and everything else, uh, in my view, uh, follow from that. Thank you. I want to follow up on your comment about our intelligence gathering capacity uh, with what's taking place with Mr. Rasami. Are we limiting our military and intelligence operatives options with detention of known terrorists by pursuing this particular policy? And 
with leadership and SOCOM and the CIA, are they going to be forced to let detainees go if they aren't able to get that information, especially with this particular uh, tenant that they're pursuing with detainee policy? Well, I think the question of letting detainees go and, and of gathering intelligence are, in, in a sense, separate. Um, I've, regrettably, in my view, the, 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 um, the CIA program was abandoned entirely. And um, instead, what we've told the rest of the world is that the, mili the, uh, uh, the Army Field Manual now sets the limit for any interrogation by any U.S. government employee. Uh, the Army Field Manual has been used as a training manual by, uh, by terrorists for years. Um, and I think what we need is a classified uh, interrogation program to be run by people who are trained in the running of it. Um, so that people we capture don't know precisely what, what they have to expect. Um, and we can get a whole lot of intelligence uh, a lot easier that way. Um, there are people who were captured by the CIA who didn't, who didn't go into their program at all, who upon capture said, I know who you guys are. Uh, I don't want any part of that, and I'm perfectly willing to cooperate, and did. Um, but if, if, you, if you limit yourself in that fashion, then um, you're really tying your own hands. Let me ask one, one final question. Does a coherent detention policy include subordinate policies on detainee transfer and release? And if so, how would you believe transfer and release policies minimize the possibility of, of, of reengagement? I think if you have a place to take people, um, evaluate them in a calm setting, um, that that's optimal. You're going to find at some point whether I mean, you may very well find that somebody was dangerous when he was apprehended, has become, for objective reasons, having nothing to do with his particular mindset, less dangerous because his, his friends are gone, um, and is, is somebody you can release. Or you may find another country willing to take him. Um, but you certainly can't do that under, with the wind blowing in your face um, under a deadline that says we're going to find this out in two months or else we're going to let him go. Very good. Thanks, Judge McCasey. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think one of the things that we should, should acknowledge looking at this is no matter which way you go, there are uncertainties. And I think one of the things that both sides have done is, well, gosh, if we did your plan, then we wouldn't know what was going to happen in this instance. I mean, we are in uncharted territory. I mean, just talking about this, as Mr. Ingle said, you know, it's not clear what rights exist at Guantanamo. They're being constantly interpreted by the courts, and that could pop up and create a problem. You know, military commissions are a relatively new thing. Um, I think we've only prosecuted, you know, help me out here, who knows, we've only prosecuted like one or two folks under military commissions at this point, um, and those were both guilty pleas, I believe. We haven't gone through a full trial with the military we, commission. We've, we've gone a, a little bit above that. I think there okay. are maybe there are four or five and a couple okay. of trials, but but your point is well taken. It's still being interpreted. So no matter which way we go here, because of the you know, unique nature that I think all witnesses testified to, um, of the fact that this is an enemy that the law, frankly, didn't contemplate, uh, certainly the law of war, so we have to improvise and go forward. Um, so I think we need to keep that in mind as looking at the options. You know, keeping all the options on the table, I think one of the biggest restrictions right now that we haven't talked that much about, and Mr. McCasey, if you could comment on this, the restrictions that have been placed on people once they're in Guantanamo, and this is because Congress opposed the closing of Guantanamo and was looking for ways to make sure that the President couldn't do that, and that's perfectly appropriate um, from a legislative standpoint. But in placing severe restrictions on when anyone from Guantanamo can be transferred back to a home country and placing an absolute bar on those inmates ever being transferred to the U.S. for trial, if an inmate is transferred to Guantanamo at this point, the President's hands are tied. And that's a big factor in their reluctance to send someone to Guantanamo. They, now, the administration has said, and Admiral McRaven does not necessarily speak for the entire administration, has said that they have not taken it off the table. And in certain circumstances, in you know, high-profile cases, is something that they would consider doing. But the reason for their reluctance is because of the fact that literally you have the situation where, to throw the cliche out there, Guantanamo is now the Hotel California. Check in, you can't check out. And, and this, by the way, keep in mind, I would hope that during the course of this process, if we are effectively doing our job of erring on the side of caution, I would hope that at some point we will pick somebody up who it turns out is not in fact a threat, that we were wrong, 
This happens. Um, I would hope it would happen, or you're not, not being thorough enough. But in the current situation, if you do that, and you pick someone up and you send them to Guantanamo, even if you find out, you know what? This is the wrong guy. Flat wrong guy, not the guy we thought he was. There's nothing that we can do but keep him there under the current law. So shouldn't we, at a minimum, if we're going to keep the options on the table, middle of the commission, whatever, stop that severe restriction on what can happen? And I'll throw one final point at it before I throw it. It's also been interpreted possibly, even if you go there, you, you know, do a military commission trial, let's say they sentence him to 10 years. You know, the, the argument is that even after the 10 years, when the sentence is up on Guantanamo, you are still restricted in being able to transfer that person out, so you would have to go to indefinite detention anyway even after they serve their sentence, because the law that we have passed has said you can't transfer this person. Isn't that a problem, and shouldn't we sort of look at some way to put some flexibility in there? Well, certainly if, if that's the effect of the law, then there ought to be flexibility. I mean, you're not going to get me to, to, to say that, um, that I'm in favor of that kind of rigidity. I think tying our hands is the last thing we want to do in this struggle. But we have to understand that, that the law restricting their transfer to the United States was passed in response to a plan to bring Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and a whole bunch of other people to, to a courtroom in Lower Manhattan and, and the hubbub and turmoil that that, and I think, deservedly created. Um, but I agree with you that when you legislate in response to, to events like that, to, to, to uh, uh, action-driving events, uh, that it doesn't always create the most rational uh, policy in the world, and that flexibility is very much called for. Um, and as far as the, the issue of indefinite detention, we, we face that um, with, with the trial of, of Osama bin Laden's chauffeur, who in essence got time served. And there were people who favored continuing to detain him after his sentence was served uh, because he continued to be a threat. Um, but it was felt that we couldn't, we couldn't do that, uh, and he was nonetheless released. Um, so. Um, we need, again, we need a coherent policy, we need a flexible policy. And when you have um, extreme actions that then become the subject of legislation, that creates the worst possible atmosphere in which to, to make these decisions. And I agree with that. And certainly I think, you know, the decision on uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and the way they sort of, the administration did not come out quickly and clearly and put a policy. I mean, we had them going through a military commission process that was stopped. Um, that certainly did, did not help this process whatsoever. I want to ask you one question on the civilian Article Three court side. We, we and we've cited this statistic uh, repeatedly, the number of terrorists which we've tried, you know, and going back to the 1993 bombing, um, Ramsey Youssef, you know, captured overseas, brought back here, tried, put in jail. That seemed to work. Um, he's been in prison for quite a while here in the U.S., went through the court system. Um, I mean, I, I would submit that al-Qaeda and affiliated groups are targeting us anywhere and everywhere they possibly can, whether we're holding people here or not. Um, why isn't that an example of why you need to have the option on the table for civilian trials for people like that? Two things. Um, first of all, um, I was in the courthouse where that case was tried and where other cases were tried. Um, that case has to be tried by jurors who have to may be kept anonymous. Um, I had an anonymous jury in the terrorism case that I tried with the blind shake. Um, we took great pains to keep those people's identity from becoming known. The day they delivered their verdict, two of them found reporters sitting at their doorsteps and were absolutely terrified. And there's no reason to believe that that kind of uh, confidentiality can be maintained. These people don't come, the jurors that is, don't come from Mars. Um, they all have friends, they all have working associates, they all have people who know that they were called for jury duty and but who could do, themselves come to the courtroom. We do do that in mob trial. I mean, that, that's a huge risk, and granted, but it's something that we've done. And I mean, there are many, many other types of people where you're in jeopardy, and, and we've set up a system you to protect. You can't guarantee it. Yeah. If the interest rate level is high enough, <clears> that's going to be breached. It was breached in my case, and I will tell you that the, that the steps taken were far in excess of what's taken in mob cases. They were taken by marshals in the morning and in the afternoon to pick up at drop-off points, picked up at pick-up points, and dropped off at drop-off points to make sure that people didn't discover who they were. But everybody's got one good friend, and they've all got relatives and working associates and so on, some of whom knew they were on that jury. Uh, so that, that's one issue. Second issue is it, it is a colossal expense. 
we had to bring marshals in from districts all over the United States to protect the courthouse because the U.S. Marshal Service in the Southern District of New York and the Eastern District of New York weren't sufficient to provide that kind of protection. Um, it was enormously costly. It was enormously disruptive. Um, the cost of protecting two judges. Uh, I was one of them. I had a security detail for 11 years. Um, and I think I'm, that that's not. I'm not. I'm not that, the point is not that it was difficult. Of course, it was difficult. It's expensive. It was very expensive. And I think. And I think. You know, one of the things we can agree on, as I said about the Khalid Sheikh Mohammed case, at a certain level of high profile, you know, you, you do create that problem. But we can capture terrorists on all kinds of levels, down to a guy like Warsami. Um, they're not all going to be on the Ramsey Youssef Khalid Sheikh Mohammed level. So surely there are some examples where this can work. Of course there are. Um, and that's all we're saying, of course there is are. to keep all and those options on the table. The, I mean, the, we, had a, we had a trial of, of uh, the Millennium Bomber up in, up, in, up in Washington, the fellow who was trying to you know, bring I'm explosives across the, across the border, um, successfully tried a district court. Um, all I'm saying is that we need to do this in military commissions as well, and to compare numbers I think is very misleading. In essence, as was pointed out before, the military commission system has been bypassed. I mean, this is akin to telling somebody, you know, I just I poured glue in your watch and it doesn't work, so you might as well throw it away. Right. Um, we need to let the system work. Um, and there's a, there's a state-of-the-art courtroom down there. I have visited it. Um, as have I. And it's, it's well able to handle these trials, if only we let them go forward. And let me just say, to be perfectly clear, I mean, my position, I believe the administration position, is all three of these options need to be on the table. The administration and, and no Democrat that I'm aware of on this committee is arguing that we should not have military commissions. We should. Or even, for that matter, indefinite detention. We have to have indefinite detention. Uh, the concern is the restrictions that have been placed legislatively are, have taken the Article III courts off the table and tied the administration in knots, and I think we need to resolve that. Yeah. And one of the key issues that we've got to resolve as we're trying to figure yeah, out how to get through this yeah, is it can't be the case if you go to Guantanamo, it's absolutely impossible to leave. We've got to figure out some way to solve that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I'm not familiar with that case. Uh, thank you. Mr. West. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member. Uh, thank you for the panel for being here. And uh, lots of academic discussion here, and what I want to do is maybe try to bring it to the common sense level of a combat soldier. You know, when you uh, deploy me outside the United States of America, you give me uh, ammunition, and uh, you give me imminent danger pay, that means I'm going into a combat zone. And in a combat zone, you have two types of individuals. The individual that's in a uniform shooting at you and playing against you, that's an enemy combatant. The individual that is not wearing a uniform, that's not a member of any type of state, is an illegal enemy combatant. I think that the problem here we have to come to a grips on if we are in a war to start to understand that they are illegal enemy combatants. Now the problem I see with this is, you know, back uh, during World War II we captured Nazi saboteurs off the coast of, I believe, New York and New Jersey, military tribunal, and they were summarily executed. And I'm not saying we go to that length, but we already have that system that was in place. So when I look at what just recently happened with the, uh, the gentleman who was accused of planning the African embassy bombings, and all of a sudden, because of a technicality in civilian courts, uh, he is not convicted for the murders of those individuals. My question to you is if we continue on in this Wasami case, or if we look at the Somali pirates that we now have in Norfolk, Virginia, who uh, killed the four Americans on their uh, U.S. flag yacht, or as well with the underwear bomber. If we do not uh, start seeing them as illegal enemy combatants, if we start to see them as common criminals and offering them constitutional rights and bring them into civilian courts, what will be the ramifications long term? And has this Africa embassy bombing already set a precedent by which uh, things can be different as we go forth in this Wasami case? These are really great questions, sir. Uh, let me first address the point Well, thank about you. I stayed up last night to write them. <laughs> <laughs> I stayed up last night thinking about what I might say in response. Uh, you, you mentioned the Gailani prosecution. This is the, the East African uh, bombing defendant who was transferred out of Guantanamo into uh, the Southern District of New York, where the judge I used to clerk for, uh, Louis Kaplan, your former colleague, um, presided. 
And as, as everyone, I think, knows and recalls, there was evidence that was suppressed, and the key evidence that was suppressed was the testimony of a witness who was discovered, uh, his identity was discovered from the interrogation of Galani himself. Uh, the government didn't dispute that the interrogation that produced his name was coercive, and it raised one of these, what we call the, you know, the fruit of the poisonous tree situation. Should the testimony of the other guy be suppressed because you learned about him in the wrong way? It, it is often suggested that this particular problem, the exclusion of this guy's testimony, wouldn't have happened if only we'd tried the same case in a military commission. But I don't think we can make that assumption. In fact, I think that it's more likely than not. You, of course, you never know when you change decision makers. You can get individual differences. But the applicable rules may well have been quite the same. One of the uh, things about the current iteration of the military commissions with the Military Commissions Act of 2009's uh, voluntariness requirements is that the rules about voluntary testimony and what's going to be admissible in terms of uh, interrogation statements have become very close to being identical to what goes on in federal criminal courts, civilian criminal courts. It's, it's often assumed that's not the case, but I actually think they're quite similar. There is an exception in the Military Commissions Act for uh, statements that might not have been voluntary, but they were obtained at the point of capture by a unit such as, as one that you would have been a part of that captures someone and immediately conducts field interrogation to get tactical and operational intelligence. Um, that can come in potentially under the Military Commissions Act, even if not voluntary. But once you're away from the moment of capture, once you've gone back into the detention system, and it's certainly once you've gone to Guantanamo and you're talking about interrogation, it's all got to be voluntary under the statute, even if you're in a military commission. Uh, maybe if, if I may just add one um, one additional point. We've, we've been talking about this a lot as a practical question about what procedures apply in the commissions, what procedures apply in the Article III courts. Uh, I do think the, the procedures in the commissions are more flexible. I think that the, uh, the error or the application of uh, Article III standards that happen in the Galliani case would be less likely to happen in the commission process. But, but I, I'm not sure that that's the point. I think the point is uh, what you spoke about when you talked about sending people into battle and who we're fi fighting and picking up there. These are not common criminals. These are military enemies. We are detaining them by our military, and consistent with really every one of our past wartime experiences, we are both entitled and it is appropriate to treat them through a military commission process. And that process may be more fair and more robust than we've ever seen before, but it's still a military process. And we, we try them before the commissions because they are the enemies of the country, and they're not common criminals, not simply because we think in a particular case there are a couple of procedures that would make the prosecution more efficient. Thank you. Thank you. I yield back. Ms. Hanabusa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Engel, uh, there's a statement in your testimony that I think kind of gets to the essence of all of this. You said the traditional law of wars are premised upon a conventional international armed conflict, or in some cases, civil wars. The established legal framework provides clear answers to who may be detained, how they must be treated, and where they should be prosecuted. None of these questions is self-evident when it comes to the war on terror. So can you tell me why it's so clear in the other situation and why it is so muddy in the situation of the war on terror? Sure. Well, I mean, largely when you're talking about the conventional laws of war, you're talking about the Geneva Conventions, you know, by and large, uh, and the common, the international, co the common law that has been worked out around that. And the Geneva Conventions really do provide specific answers to how we treat prisoners of war, you know, those legitimate combatants who meet these standards. And it talked about, talks about where they can be kept. It talks about where they may be prosecuted if they are to be prosecuted uh, for war crimes and, and the like. Uh, and none of these questions really exist or apply when we're talking about individuals who are not prisoners of war uh, and individuals who are not covered uh, by international armed conflict. We've seen some clarity, particularly with the Supreme Court's Hamdan decision and the way in which it interpreted common Article 3 that has provided some baseline treatment standards and the like, uh, but many of these other issues are issues that have been worked out by the executive branch with Congress, with the courts, uh, and the answers even now, almost 10 years uh, later, you know, are not perfectly clear. So if, if this war on terror, or however variant that we may continue to call it, uh, if we're going to continue in this murky area? Well, look, I, I think we have more clarity now about these standards, uh, a lot more clarity now than we had uh, you know, on 9-11. On I think the United States has taken the lead. I think Congress has taken the lead uh, in elucidating 
you know, the governing law. Because when we talk about international law, when we talk about the laws of war, apart from things like the Geneva Conventions, you know, these answers don't exist in the sky. Um, the, the, the written bodies of law, there is no criminal code or for the law of war as such, but it is worked out from time to time. Uh, and I think we do have some answers, but uh, as we've seen you know, from this discussion, um, we've seen from the reaction to Section 1034, there are still questions that are being worked but, out. But it's here. a unilateral act versus something that you would see that nations would get together and sort of agree to some kind of basic premise. And that's what I see as the problem. I'd like to speak to uh, Mr. Is it Mukasey? Is that correct? <laughs> yes, it is. Thank you. Okay. And, and this is regarding the, um, I know I'm going to not pronounce it correctly. Is it the Bomadian? Bomadian. Bomadian right. decision. And I think you were Attorney General when that came out in 2008. Okay. One of the things that I found in the decision that, that struck me and wanted to discuss with you is the fact that towards the end, the Supreme Court says that the, because conflicts have been limited in duration, we've had the ability to have the outer boundaries of war powers undefined, basically the presidential right. And I think the discussion was a separation of the powers. What I'm curious about in reading uh, uh, part of the testimony that we've had is, given that situation and given the thing that the Bomadian decision seem to have also looked at geographic, the, the geographic area of, of what is the status of Guantanamo, for example. And it, they talked about the insular cases. I'm from Hawaii, so of course the insular cases development is very critical to me. So what I'd like to know is, at what point are we going to see this clarity? Because at some point we, as Congress, cannot legislate to the point where the Constitution and the Supreme Court comes back and says, well, you can kind of do it for now, but at some point we're going to address this issue. And I'd like to know how you thought about that. Well, um, I think that you have to legislate in the here and now, and you have to legislate with what we have. So far as past conflicts being of limited duration, I should point out that that is only in retrospect. Um, the Germans didn't march into Poland um, in 1939, uh, scattering, uh, scattering little pieces of paper saying, don't worry, this is all going to be over by 1945 and the Fuhrer is going to blow his brains out. Um, that's something that we achieved, and it was limited in duration only in retrospect. Um, this conflict, um, I'm hoping, will have an end. Um, how, will, how are we going to know? We'll know. Um, and it's not something for us to worry about while it's ongoing. What we have to worry about while it's ongoing is how we behave and how we treat our adversaries. And the fact that this committee is holding hearings like this and passing the kind of law that it has passed on to the, to the, to, uh, to that, to the House and that passed the House um, is, is wonderful testimony that, that we are a nation that, that does that and that worries about those things. But I don't think we, have to, we can sit here and worry about the duration of the conflict um, and paralyze ourselves um, from acting. We act with the facts as we know them. If the facts change, you can always change a statute. Um, but inaction is going to get us uh, in a place that we don't want to be. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Rundin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Judge McCasey, in uh, Chairman's opening statement, he referenced the administration's overwhelming preference of prosecuting uh, terrorists in federal court. Um, what are the downsides to having the two-track system, whereas cases that are seen feasible are tried in a federal court and the weaker ones are tried in the commission? Um, I think that sends the wrong message for so many reasons it's hard to know where to begin. Um, first, it suggests that military commissions are some sort of lesser form of, uh, of justice. They're not. Uh, they are, in point of fact, a robust, able system. Um, secondly, we shouldn't be making principal decisions based on the feasibility of a case or the infeasibility of a case. We should be making those decisions based on an intelligent assessment of where they belong, a principled assessment of where they belong. And finally, um, even if you try to make an assessment in, in advance of what the feasibility of a case is, um, I think the Gailani case is a perfect example of the fact that you don't always guess right. Um, so, for all of those reasons, um, I think we have to do we have to do this on some basis other than projected feasibility. Thank you. And um, this is really for all of you. 
if you want to take a quick stab at it. You know, um, this past month, President Obama issued an executive order establishing a process to periodically review continued uh, detention of each detainee at Gitmo. And um, are any of you concerned about such a process being an advers adversarial system on top of all the habeas litigation? Uh, Congressman Runny and I, let me uh, take a stab at that. And at, at first, let me also add one point to what um, Judge McKay indicated with respect to military commissions. I think one thing that we have failed to account for with respect to a distinction between military commissions and the civilian courts is ultimately, uh, and I think this goes to Congressman West's point, ultimately the, the people who are in the best position to judge, judge the guilt or innocence of individuals who are accused of committing war crimes are other soldiers. They have been on the battlefield. They understand what all of this is about. And I think there lies a very significant aspect of military commissions that you don't necessarily have in a civilian court. Going to uh, your question regarding um, the review of detention at, at Guantanamo, having lived through the combatant status review tribunal process, administrative review board process, uh, we are acknowledging somehow that things are different here than they have traditionally been on the battlefield. And we did so with both the CSRTs and the ARBs. Um, we provided what I believed was a system that had certain process as part of it that worked. To now take this and turn it into an adversarial proceeding where you have counsel for a detainee and no judge there to adjudicate what is being done in that proceeding, uh, I think, invites uh, a very, very difficult situation for those commanders who are charged with uh, responsibilities for detention. You are, you are incorporating into a non-criminal court type situation, an administrative determination, a whole set of, of legal um, uh, aspects that I think wholly uncalled for in that environment. Anyone else? I'd like to uh, follow up on that a little bit. I'd, I first would emphasize how important periodic review of some kind, whether it's by executive order or by the statutory mechanism in the Defense Authorization Act, how important it is precisely because of the open-ended timeline concern that Representative Hanabusa raised a moment ago. This is, this is how you respond to the indefiniteness of war against something like Al Qaeda. Um, I, I have some sympathy with uh, Mr. Del Orto's point about uh, the risks of, of turning this into a, a sort of a second round of habeas as well. Um, I do want to respond and disagree to some extent with the, the point he made, however, about the relative expertise of military officers versus civilian jurors as fact finders. And I, it's a limited disagreement. I, I'm sure that's actually quite correct as to, for example, the Omar Khadr situation where you have a a, a firefight and there's an alleged war crime involved with the firefight involving soldiers and it's it's the sort of thing soldiers certainly know better than civilian jurors um, but one of the things that's funny about the current circumstance is a lot of times what we're going to charge in commissions as material support or the sort of things whatever it was that this Warsami fellow was up to if it was tried in a commission these will be things that don't look like what soldiers train and do in combat situations that that are more like what the intelligence community deals with um, and we shouldn't assume that military officers have special expertise. That said, I will note that military officers are quite possibly going to be less likely to be um, over-impressed by allegations that someone's linked to al-Qaeda and so on and so forth. And I think you see that in the Hamdan Military Commission case where they acquitted on some counts, convicted on a lesser count, and then gave a time-served sentence. Thank you. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Um, Mr. Langevin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank the uh, the panel for this uh, uh, discussion today. Your presence uh, uh, was very uh, enlightening, and this is clearly uh, uh, an extremely con uh, contentious issue that I think that we need to address as a nation if we have uh, any hope of moving forward uh, with our history involving Guantanamo Bay and ultimately, of course, the AUMF uh, that was issued after 9-11. I'd like to ask uh, the, the panel specifically their thoughts about the potential effects of closing off completely the ability of, uh, uh, to try uh, any terrorist 
in Article III courts? And second, would it be possible to have uh, Article III courts at Guantanamo? Well, the short answer to your second question is no. Um, as far as um, closing off Article III courts, I don't think any of us, uh, even the most skeptical, um, and I probably fit into that category. I, uh, maybe maybe uh, Mr. Engel is, is, is slightly more skeptical of, of, of Article III courts. I don't think any of us uh, says that you close off Article III courts. I think what we're talking about here really is where you set the default. And um, there are those of us who believe that the default should be set at military commissions for reasons that we've explained, and other folks who think it should be set at, at Article III courts. But I don't think anybody favors closing off Article III courts. Um, they're, they're an important tool, and as a as a former card-carrying federal judge, I have great confidence in them. Uh, and actually, if I may add, um, th there's sometimes there's confusion when we talk about terrorism prosecutions in Article III courts and military commissions that sometimes we're mixing apps apples and oranges. I mean, there's no question that uh, the Article III courts have prosecuted, you know, have overseen the prosecutions of a wide variety of terrorism cases since 9-11 and, and before that were folks who were picked up by the FBI using traditional law enforcement mechanisms in this country. Uh, and I don't think there's any disagreement, by and large, that the vast majority, or if not all, you know, nearly all of those cases are both appropriate and should go forward uh, in Article III courts, at least as the default rule. Uh, by contrast, when we talk about folks who were picked up in wartime circumstances, uh, either by military services or by our intelligence service services, often picked up by foreign governments who then turn them over uh, to the United States, in connection with th this ongoing armed conflict, I think it's there, and these are basically the folks at Gitmo and folks who are going to be picked up in the future, uh, where the military commission system would seem to be most appropriate to those circumstances and uh, you know, something as the default rule under those circumstances. I think it's very interesting that we're actually seeing a lot of consensus on, I, I think all of us came into this largely agreeing about the uh, need to have all three of these tools, the legitimacy of all these tools, and a fair amount of consensus emerging about the need for some degree of flexibility. And I, and I would associate myself with uh, Judge McKenzie's remarks about uh, the question really being where's the default set. Um, I, I do want to underline that in, these, in this circumstance, as, as Mr. Engel described it, of the overseas capture, which is really what this is about, much more so than within the United States. Um, there is a fact pattern that can and has arisen from time to time that, if nothing else, shows you that you do have to have some flexibility to be able to prosecute in a civilian court, and that is when it is a foreign government that has custody of an individual, and they won't give him to us unless we're going to pursue a civilian criminal prosecution. That is, they won't transfer him into our custody were we to pursue a military commission alternative. There was a fellow uh, who was I believe in the Netherlands, uh, his name has escaped me, but I believe it was Dela Ima, if I'm recalling correctly, and he was in Dutch custody. Uh, he was uh, involved in the insurgency in Iraq. They would not possibly have given him to us if we were going to put him before a military commission, and I believe it was actually a diplomatic agreement that we would not actually put him in a military commission or military detention. If we wanted him, it was Article Three or nothing. Examples like that hopefully will be rare, but when they arise, we need to make sure that the president has the ability to say, yeah, we'll take them, even though it's not our preferred option. Thank you. Um, Ms. Chesney, let me ask a different topic. Uh, in response to a question or comment, uh, Judge McKenzie, uh, what are your thoughts uh, about uh, shipboard detentions? So shipboard detention, is, is, as soon as you raise it, I think all of us think of the British hulks lying in the East River in the American Revolution, the horrors that the American uh, soldiers captured there went through. And others uh, may think of the, uh, the Japanese uh, so-called hell ships of World War II. There, there's a terrible history associated with them because, generally speaking, they're deeply unhealthy places to hold people, historically speaking, and often they're dangerous as well. Many an American POW was accidentally killed by friendly fire when we fired on ships in World War II that turned out to have prisoners aboard them. So there's a justifiable negative reputation there. It's uh, carried forward in the Third Geneva Convention, which says prisoners of war have to be held on land, full, full stop. That provision is not applicable. That's a provision applicable only to international armed conflicts, which is not what we're talking about here. It's not clear that in non-international armed conflict the same strict rule applies, but we can look to the Army's longstanding regulations about shipboard detention. Um, Army Regulation 190-8 has long provided that you, you have to strictly limit it 
but it can be done for temporary uh, operational exigency reasons, particularly if you've captured someone at sea. I, I agree with uh, Judge Mukasey that at, at the end of the day, it was lawful to hold Warsami for the two-month period that we did hold him. And you, you, you couldn't show that that violated international law. Um, but there's no question also that we do not want to be in the business of long-term uh, Guantanamo at sea. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. No question. Mr. Reyes. I wanted to clear that point up. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. I did read your testimony, but I apologize for not being here earlier uh, due to another conflict. But I was interested, based on what I read and what I heard, what you think are the long term implications of what has been the the whole Guantanamo experience or the, or the process, uh, both to us and to our allies, and then uh, in their, if you can consider the, the kinds of asymmetric threats that we face uh, uh, today, um, what can we expect long term uh, from, this, uh, from this issue? Well, let me, let me uh, begin, Congressman Reyes. Going back to the earliest days of the determination to house detainees at Guantanamo, there was a fairly extensive look at potential options for where to house folks. And uh, as Secretary Rumsfeld, I think, once, once uh, described, it was the least worst of a number of bad options. There weren't very many options open to us, particularly if we were not going to keep them in Afghanistan because of the nature of the footprint we wanted to limit uh, in, uh, in, in the theater there, um, the practical uh, reasons for trying to maintain a very secure facility, uh, and you know, concerns about uh, having folks in the United States who, you know, who unlike traditional soldiers uh, who fight in accordance with the laws of war, would do anything were they to break out and, uh, and be a true threat to the populace. Guantanamo became the one place where we believed we had the ability to first ensure that they were secure there and two, uh, put us in a position to make, take maximum opportunity to develop as much intelligence as we could. Having said that, I think the reasons, and as I said in my earlier um, testimony, I think the reasons for, for opening Guantanamo then hold true today, uh, where we have a dynamic situation, a changeable foe, an uncertain operational picture in terms of geography. Guantanamo, to my way of thinking, still presents us with a very uh, well-developed and mature now facility with all of the construction that's taken place there, procedures that have been established for um, detaining uh, the sorts of folks we're picking up on the battlefield and continuing to uh, interrogate them as the need um, warrants. I would add um, that I mean, have it, Guantanamo, in my view, is a, is a state-of-the-art facility. Um, I visited, when I was a district judge, forget maximum security, medium security facilities in this country, uh, federal prisons. Guantanamo compares favorably with the conditions in those prisons insofar as how it treats people. Um, if, you were, if we were to close it, um, we would be doing away not only with all of that, it is at a place that is remote, secure, and humane. Um, we would be doing away with all of that. We'd also be doing away with all of the experience, the collective experience that we have in holding people there, understanding how to deal with them, how to control them. Um, that, it, that would be an enormous sacrifice. Forget the financial sacrifice of having built that kind of facility, in, including a a, an expensive courtroom facility in which we can try uh, military commission cases. Long term, what I hope in response to your question is that we um, here and the world at large comes to its senses about what Guantanamo is and what it isn't, um, and that we, if we have to keep it open, that we can keep it open and do it in a straightforward, unashamed way, because there's nothing to be ashamed of down there. Greetings from Texas, Congressman. Uh, uh, you asked about asymmetric threats in the future course of things, and looking very far ahead, I, I want to sound a pessimistic note and, and suggest that we may look back on this time 
amazingly enough, as the easy phase in terms of the legal and policy debates. We may, 10 years down the road, be dealing with the situation in which we long for the days in which we could at least say that there was something called Al Qaeda that had some sort of organizational trappings and that it wasn't so completely diffused that you can't even come to grips with exactly who the enemy is. One of the, one of the leading theoreticians of, of Al Qaeda is a man named Al Suri. And Al Suri's core idea is, is a familiar one um, for those who study non state violence. Um, it's the idea of leaderless resistance. He has been urging for years and years that Al Qaeda's leadership do everything it can to transform the movement from organization to uh, ideology and inspiration where everyone might decide to self radicalize and engage in uh, violence against us. And if and when we really get to that point in an even greater degree than we've got today, we're going to have one heck of a time trying to figure out how to bring all these tools to bear on it. And, uh, maybe I'll just say uh, on, a, on a more positive note. Um, uh, we, I mean, we've understandably been focusing on issues in which there's disagreement, uh, but uh, when I look at the long term and I think about you know, where we've come over the last 10 years, I, I'm actually heartened by the degree to which there is some bipartisan agreement on a number of issues uh, you know, with respect to this armed conflict. Uh, you know, we've, we've seen there's, there's common agreement that we are at war uh, with, with this enemy, Al-Qaeda, and its affiliates. There's common agreement that we may detain these folks under the laws of war and for the long term, and even with respect to things like military commissions, which seem to uh, divide the country uh, you know, just a few years ago, we've seen President Obama support military commissions, at least in principle, and actually push through you know, or support an act that Congress passed to update and amend the Military Commissions Act of 2009. And so through now two successive administrations, we, there is actually a substantial degree of consensus on a lot of big issues. Uh, with respect to the legal framework of the, uh, the war on terror, and unsurprisingly, there are still issues of policy and law that divide folks. But uh, you know, but I actually see, uh, you know, I, I see things moving in a positive direction on a lot of fronts. Thank you, Mr. Garamendi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I too apologize for not being here earlier. I was in the Resources Committee defending the work you did on the uh, wilderness study in Mono County. Good piece of work. But the issue at hand today is uh, exceedingly important. As you recall, we had a rather controversial uh, moment with the National Defense Authorization Act. I want to compliment you on having this hearing, bringing us together to deal with some of the uh, extraordinarily important and very complex issues surrounding it. The one question I have goes to Guantanamo, and that is, could it be a federal court as well as a military court at Guantanamo? Um, it, it can't. Um, the Constitution I'm sorry, the Constitution prescribes that um, um, cases be tried where the crimes are committed. And um, you can't, forgetting the fact that there is no federal district, Congress could always define the outlines of a federal district. Um, but, and there's no authorization for holding court there. You can solve that too. But, um, and forgetting where you would get a jury from and where you would hold them and all of that. Um, I believe the Constitution absolutely bars trying somebody someplace where, other than where the crime was committed. Thank you. Um, Ms. Sanchez, you had another question? I just, uh, I just wanted to put something in for the record because I know that uh, Mr. Del Orto had, um, and I agree with uh, a lot of what you're saying with respect to how important um, or how well our military men and women uh, can judge uh, the combatants. And to a large extent, I do agree with that. But you mentioned in saying that uh, Mr. Um, West's comments about how it had served us in the past. And the one, the one case that he brought up in particular was, were the six German saboteurs. And I just wanted to add for the record, that was probably not a very good case to bring up considering um, you know, uh, putting them before a firing squad when, in fact, they had turned themselves in. Uh, most of them didn't even know what they were coming over to do, et cetera. It's just a very bad case in point, so I wanted to put that to the record. But I do agree um, with, with your comments about how most of the time our military can be some of the best judges with respect to that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions. What are some of the possible ramifications for bringing foreign terrorist detainees to the United States 
in terms of constitutional rights and immigration related issues that could be triggered well um, I think it's I think we're all aware that once somebody comes to this country uh, there attaches to them a whole panoply of rights uh, that they don't have so long as they're outside it and that's true even post Boumedia. Um so far as um, immigration issues once somebody is in this country um, there are then limits on how long we can hold them in an effort to deport them. Um, if it were necessary to deport any of the people that we brought here for trial, whether because of the expiration of their sentence or whether because of their acquittal, um, the current state of the law is that we have essentially six months to find a place for them to be sent. Um, and then we may very well have to let them go. Now, whether that would hold in a difficult case or not, um, I don't know. But I don't want to have to bet the farm on the outcome of that kind of exercise is, I think, once they get here, they are within the jurisdiction of any federal court where they're, where they're, where they're held. And uh, there is a whole array of lawyers who have said that they are perfectly well prepared to file as many cases as they can, um, whether they're frivolous or, 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 or well-founded, in an attempt to challenge conditions of confinement, fact of confinement, the whole range of issues uh, that can be challenged in a federal court. And we are going to find our federal courts in the business of doing virtually nothing but defending those cases if those folks are brought here. On the question of constitutional rights, uh, the interesting question is what ultimately will turn out to be the case for the detainees who stay at Guantanamo when they're being prosecuted in commissions, when they invoke the Sixth Amendment Confrontation Clause and Fifth Amendment due process, particularly relating to uh, 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 coercion and voluntariness. Um, it remains to be seen and is an open question whether or not the constitutional trial related rights that, that are at issue for sure if you bring them into the United States, whether they might be at issue as well and perhaps even to the same effect in a commission proceeding. There's years of litigation awaiting us before we know for sure what the D.C. Circuit or the Supreme Court ultimately will have to say on that. We can't assume though that the current state of play is or will be that they get a certain set of rights in the United States but they just won't get that at Guantanamo. They may well get the same constitutional rights in the end. We don't know. We don't have a crystal ball, but you, you can't rule it out. On the immigration issue, um, the, the key issue, it, it is, I think, the most significant problem and issue that needs to be dealt with when one considers bringing someone from outside the United States into the U.S. The Supreme Court in, in 2001 in Zadvidas had said uh, in a non-national security case, if you had some person who's removable, but for whatever reason, he's a stateless person or he's at risk of torture, whatever it is, you just practically can't remove him. Then a, as Judge Mukasey said, after six months, or roughly speaking, you, you've potentially constitutionally got to let him go into the United States. However, in the same decision, uh, Justice Breyer from the majority wrote specifically that the, the majority was not talking about a terrorism, and they use that word, terrorism or national security scenario. They didn't say that the answer would be opposite in that scenario, but they went out of their way to say that they weren't setting that rule. And in a later case called Clark v. Martinez, an opinion by Justice Scalia, again underlined that that was not necessarily the rule for terrorism and security cases. And Justice Scalia, for the majority, specifically referred to the Alien Terrorist Removal Court, the special immigration proceeding that we haven't yet had occasion to use, but we, we well might in one of these cases, suggesting fairly strongly that the answer might be different in that context. Anybody else on that one? Well, I think I, I, would, I would just add I mean, that when we're talking about bringing people into the United States, and we're, particularly we're talking about people from uh, difficult or failed states like when we're talking about Yemen or Somalia or the like, we need to assume that they're not leaving here uh, at the end of the day, and uh, either they will be kept in detention if we believe we can detain them, or ultimately someday they will be released if our legal authority for detention you know, lapses. And you know, those are serious issues that need to be considered in addition to the burdens of nonstop litigation that Judge McCasey alluded to, uh, you know, that will come. Um, so it is, a, it is a weighty decision and one uh, that shouldn't be made solely uh, with a focus on a particular criminal prosecution, you know, which could have a short term with uncertain results. So, uh, <clears throat> there's been some discussion about whether uh, Ahmed Warsami could qualify for prosecution before a military commission. Do you believe that the Military Commissions Act would need to be amended 
in order to establish jurisdiction over individuals who are part of an associated force such as al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula? I, I don't personally believe so. I, I think it's certainly a question that would be litigated, and it's, it's not a trivial question. Uh, you know, but the, the Military Commissions Act, as, a cur as it's currently written, uh, permits the prosecution of individuals who have engaged in hostilities against the United States or who has purposefully and materially supported hostilities against the United States or its coalition partners. Uh, again, I mean, I, I think to the extent that, that this committee were to look at this issue and we're seeking to expand uh, you know, to include associated forces alike, I think that could be helpful. Uh, you know, but I do think the government could argue and likely win a case like Al Shahab, you know, or Wasami uh, under the Military Commissions Act. I think with Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, I think the government would win this. Um, it may have to come forward with evidence. It would prefer not to use in court to do it, but it could do it. I think Al Shabaab, from an outside perspective, not knowing the classified information that's relevant to the question, I nonetheless have the perception that it is a substantially more difficult question, uh, complicated by the fact that in Al Shabaab you have some actual Al Qaeda figures who are effectively dual hatted. Um, and as to some Al Shabaab members, they're clearly going to come within the scope of the Commissions Act and Detention Authority under the AOMF, whereas other, um, especially more of the indigenous uh, personnel in Al Shabaab, that's not necessarily the case. And then again, of course, it'll all change over the course of a year's time. It's an evolving threat. In the past year, we've seen Al Shabaab's leadership declare uh, formal allegiance to Al Qaeda. Um, and in a year or two, we may find that Al Shabaab is relatively uncontroversially described as as part and parcel of al-Qaeda itself, or we may find it remains an indigenous uh, unit that's entirely separate. This is one of the reasons why we're um, addressing this in, this in our current bill, because things do change, and, and then probably it would be open to be ad addressed in a, in a future one. And one final question for uh, Judge McCasey. I'd like to ask if you would hone in on how the detainee habeas cases are also impacting the evolution of targeting authorities pursuant to the AUMF. Can Congress's affirmation of the AUMF help prevent policymaking by the courts in this area? Wouldn't the affirmation in Section 1034 provide more solid ground for the lawyers in the executive branch? Um, the answer to that is an emphatic yes. Um, it turns out that um, targeting decisions are being made uh, by reference to the developing body of habeas cases um, that determine who is and who isn't um, targetable, that, or that, that we're not meant to determine that. They determine who can and can't be held, um, which is a very different, very different question. Um, and the, the judges who have, do not have the fact-gathering uh, ability or, frankly, the competence, let alone are not politically responsible, um, are making those decisions in habeas cases, and that body of law is then being used in the absence of any other authority um, as a basis for lawyers in the Defense Department making targeting decisions. Uh, the cases were never meant for that. Um, I'm, my hope is that it would mortify uh, the judges who are deciding those cases to know that their decisions have those implications, but the fact is that they do. And once you create a body of law, it is very difficult to control how it's going to be used by other people, which is an excellent reason for Congress stepping in and creating uh, flexibility here and, and making certain that we don't have targeting decisions being made on the basis of ad hoc uh, decisions in habeas cases. Hey, can I ask one follow-up to, to that sure. question? Is it, Judge, is it possible for someone to make a case, because I've heard this in in, in some of the uh, uh, people that are that are questioning the legality of setting up a place like Guantanamo, is it possible for somebody to make a case that at least some of these people being held there are in a state of legal limbo or legal suspended animation because they can't be moved one way or, or the other. And if it is, what would be the entity that would be able to make, that they could make that case to? Is it the World Court, or, 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 or where would they be able to take it? I mean, Guantanamo is controlled by the United States. And in fact, um, the fact of control uh, was the basis for the Supreme Court saying that um, 
that the people detained there um, could be could have could have habeas rights or something like habeas rights. Um, I don't think they're in any kind of limbo. Uh, they're certainly not in any kind of limbo so long as we have courts in this country who will rule on what we do in places that we control. Um, I don't think that's something that we really uh, need to concern ourselves with. We certainly don't want to cede jurisdiction over that decision to a world body uh, that is essentially a political uh, court um, that makes decisions on on, uh, on something other than on the basis of something of something other than United States law. That it seems to me is something that is a decision that can be can and should be controlled by the political branches of government, this branch, uh, the legislative branch, of course, and the executive. Um, and that judges should be following those decisions, not making them. Thank you, Member Smith. I think you just said two things. I want to follow up a little bit on the, um, the question of, of targeting based on the detainability of the target. I wasn't sure I heard quite correctly what you said there, uh, Mr. McCasey. So you're saying that you know, there are decisions um, to target people uh, based on the fact that they're not detainable, so we have to take them out? Was that? No, it's my understanding that in determining whether somebody can be targeted or not, right. um, and Mr. Delordo, I think, can probably speak to this more authoritatively because he knows about the decision-making process within the Pentagon, but that lawyers in the Pentagon are involved in those decisions, and so they look for a body of law. Yeah. And the body of law that they look for is the body of law that's contained in habeas cases. Habeas cases aren't for that purpose at all. They're for the purpose of determining detainability. And so you wind up having a body of law created in one setting being used in a setting which was never intended to be used um, with results that, that can't possibly be good. Well, certainly it's a very complicated situation. I know the DOD is going to in terms of who they can target, whether for detention, killing, or capturing. Um, those lists move around and there's a whole lot of history there. But um, I. I think I understand understand your point. Just a quick question. Mr. McCasey had answered about Article Three courts at Guantanamo, uh, that he did not think that that was a constitutional option. I just wanted to see what the other three, um, how they felt about that as a possible option. I'd certainly defer to the judge's view on that. Uh, I've not looked at the question specifically, so I don't have an answer beyond uh, my agreement with Judge McCasey. Just, just the the to be specific about the provision, um, Article 3, Section 3 says, uh, the trial of all crimes, except in cases of impeachment, shall be by jury, and such trial shall be held in the state where the said crimes shall have been committed, but when not committed within any state, the trial shall be at such place or places as the Congress by law may have directed. Um, you, if you have a crime that is not committed in any state, I suppose you could have a court, but then the question would be, where do you get where the jury? Do, where do you get the jury? Right. Where do you hold them? Um, I mean, did the, uh, how do you, you have to create a, you add Guantanamo, I guess, onto one of the existing districts? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a mayor's nest. Yeah. Congress created a district of, I'm not sure exactly the title, but in West Berlin in, in the American sector. Um, I think it tried one case. It may even have been a, it's in the 1970s, I believe. It was, uh, do you know the details of this, Steve? There's an obscure historical episode. It, this sort of thing can be done. It is difficult, but, but as, uh, as uh, Judge McKenzie said, the uh, scenario in which the offense is entirely extraterritorial by definition doesn't present the you've got to try it somewhere other than Guantanamo scenario. You can put it where Congress wants to put it. Um, there's the expense and the logistical questions associated with that. In theory, I suppose you could piggyback on the facilities there at Guantanamo, and you could create the district court for Guantanamo there, um, and you could draw on the, the substantial population that lives there as the jurors. Uh, I'm not sure this is the right solution, but I think actually it probably could be done. Okay. Mr. Engel? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think the, the principal question would be the difficulties in finding the judge and the jury and, and, and the like. Um, I think probably as a statutory matter, some Congress could create either a territorial court and may well be able to create an Article III court. I don't know if the West Berlin court was in fact an Article III court or, or a probably a, a, a territorial court or the like, but um, it would not be easy uh, and you know, I don't know whether it would be advisable, but uh, if con Congress had broad authority you know, to create the federal courts and so if if it were to target the issue, it, it may be theoretically possible. But I, I have not studied it, I confess. Okay. 
I would just add really quickly, if it's an Article Three court, we'd be talking about the mother of all confirmation hearings, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's true. All right, thank you. I appreciate the detail. I have no further questions. Thank you, uh, each of you, for being here today. I think you've been an outstanding uh, panel of witnesses, and we, we really appreciate your expertise and your willingness to help us out on this issue. With that, this uh, committee stands adjourned.